details. Aloha. Happy July 1st. Happy Canada Day for all our Canadian friends out there. And I am Winston Welch, delighted that you are joining us today for Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, and events with the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization. Joining me today in the studio, I am honored to have Mr. Robert Gentry as my guest. The keen watcher of the show will remember Bob as one of my first guests, and many remarked on his wonderful personality and spirit of aloha in giving back to the community. At the time, we discussed having Bob back on the show, and I am delighted that he is here today to share his thoughts on life, the LGBTQ movement, and some of his own incredible experiences, including the groundbreak groundbreaking being elected the first openly gay mayor of a U.S. city, period, and that was back in the 80s. So welcome to the show today again. Thanks for being my guest. Thank you, Winston. It's great to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, the last time you were here, you were here under the auspices of VASH, the Visitor Aloha Society of Hawaii. Correct. Where you explained to us the wonderful work that that organization does. And your, your role in that as a volunteer, and that was just really um, an amazing show to have. So I, I inspired by you as were my guests. And then as we were talking, and you said, oh, I have this uh, even uh, wonderful, interesting history. And so we, we talked about you getting back here. And so we're here. And I was just excited here. We just are just on the tail end of Pride Month. So I think this is an, as close as we could get uh, based on our schedule. So we'll just say this is an extension of Pride, your 50th anniversary of Stonewall. How's that? Absolutely. And, okay, so we're celebrating the whole year. And it's a, it's a huge accomplishment, obviously, to have been elected the first openly, and we, it's, it's kind of strange to say that in this day and age, isn't it? Openly gay or out um, mayor of a U.S. Well, I think we're still getting there, but it still is an important term and a concept. Mm -hmm. Because yes. there are probably, we know there are lots of gay elected officials in America, um, but the ones that are open are the ones that are making a difference from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Because without being open and being at the table as an open person, your impact is diminished. Well, that's, and that's, I agree with you on that uh, exactly. But there's a lot of people that say, you know what, what I, what I do in my private life or who I'm married to or all, all that, that's my, that's my own, that's mine. I don't want that out there. That's not, that's not for public consumption. Um, you probably have a different take on well, that. Well, of course, because it's out there for every straight person in the country. Why shouldn't it be out there for gay people? And I'll tell you why it hasn't been. Because it is still considered and was considered shameful. So when that criticism would come to me, for instance, and say, Bob, we don't care about your bedroom. I say, yes, you do. Or you wouldn't even have that as a criticism of my being open. Right. right. If I was fully accepted and fully part of the fabric of society, it would be no issue. But there was, and there still is an issue. It's a lot less, obviously, but it still is an issue. It's still an issue because even in this day and age, in our own great nation, we can still, as LGBTQ people, be fired, evicted. That's correct. In half over half the states, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Which is shocking when you think about this in modern day America, that this, this open discrimination, you don't even have to be gay. You can just say, you look a little gay to me. That's right. You're fired. That's so, right. And you don't have to even be gay to be fired for <laughs> right. someone thinking you're gay, which is incredible. But you were groundbreaking here in 1982, <clears throat> was it? I was first elected to the city council of Laguna Beach in 1982, and the council put me in the mayor's position, the mayor's seat, in 1983. And so at that time, was Laguna Beach, was this, uh, what we might use familiar terms of red or blue or neither? Um, um, actually, um, the politics of the city were fairly balanced. Uh, the position that I held for 12 years was nonpartisan. So I did not run as a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. 
I ran as Robert Gentry okay. on my own uh, platform and policies and whatever. Okay. And you were reelected. I was I was reelected three times. Like most California cities, when you're elected to local office, it's typically a four year term. Okay. At the end of that four year term, you can either uh, not re not re up for the election, or you can stand again, and you can do that for several times. And so you were obviously a fairly popular mayor that you got reelected. Uh, I did. I was very fortunate. I was reelected three times in the city of Laguna Beach. So I served for a little over twelve years totally. And I'm guessing a lot of that had to do with that you had a great police department and you paved the roads and picked up the trash and all the pedestrian things that mayors do. We did. And uh, we were and are a city manager form of government, which means that we have a very strong administration. And that administration in detail takes care of trash, streets, police, all the rest of it. And city council members who are elected are the policy people. Okay. They set the policy and they hire and fire the city manager. Okay. So very much like a board of directors. Exactly. Okay. And how important was it? How important was it to Laguna Beach or to California, to the nation when you were elected? Was this big news? Was it even news? Um, how, how was it received? Was it, in, was it even a, an issue in, the, in your selection amongst your peers? Um, it started out to be a little bit of a problem before I was elected when I was campaigning and we were putting together a campaign committee and people said, well, Bob, what are we going to do about the gay issue? And I said, we're not going to do anything about it. I will address it. It's me. I will be authentic and address it. And I did. And folks accepted it. And starting with your peers, uh -huh. and then was this picked up by the main, mainstream media afterwards when, when you were elected, or did they just kind of, was it not a, a non-story? It, it was a little bit of a story after the election. When I was elected, the next day I got a call from a reporter at the Los Angeles Times who said, Bob, I don't know if you know this or not, but our research indicates that you are the first openly gay mayor in the nation. What do you think about that? Well, it just blew me away. I never thought it would be, never thought about it. I just knew I was Bob Gentry, I was gay, I was responsible. I had a life that I was responsible with and I was authentic. And, and, so, and this is just one, I think it's important to, when we think about this, this is, this is one facet of you. This is like you being an Episcopalian or uh, you know, a Mormon or, or, or an atheist or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of you, but it's, it's certainly not all of you. But it's not all of me, but it's in an elected position. To me, it becomes extremely important. Why? Because I come from an oppressed body of citizens. Mm -hmm. And because I come from an oppressed body of citizens, it has much more impact on what I say and what I do, not only for those folks that I represent, but for my own office. And for the wider community at large, were you contacted by people? Were you contacted by teenagers and 60-year-olds yes. and 30-year-olds yes. saying, yes. thank you so much for being brave yes. and being out and being open? Yes. Yes, I was. Yeah. I'm just... And I spent a lot of my time educating um, folks not only in Laguna Beach, but around Southern California, whenever I was asked to about the issue of homosexuality. So you were somewhat of a uh, easy spokesman uh, to call up and, and come and talk about something. Yes, because I, I would never say no. Okay. Because I feel it was that important. And, and it is, and yeah. it still is. It's it is. still important mm -hmm. because I think people don't realize, straight people don't realize that that we still, if we are, if we're LGBTQ, we still have to come out every single day, potentially. True. When mm -hmm. someone says, uh, I don't know, it could be something like uh, you're chatting with your neighbor and, and you say, oh, we are, we enjoy living in this neighborhood very much. And they say, you and your, your wife. Mm -hmm. Right. And they know, uh, my, my husband, right? right? Right. And so we still are coming out all the time. And it's those brave moments with people. And I always challenge people, if you're, if you're curious as to what it's like to be a gay person in America, even in very liberal and free Hawaii, take your, your male friend's hand and walk down the beach or walk down uh, Bishop Street uh, hand in hand and see what the reception is. And sure. then switch to a female friend and walk down the street, same street, 
going back the other way. And you'll, you'll understand what that's like. Of course. Yeah. Is, it, is it different here in Hawaii, speaking of Hawaii, uh, for, for gay folks or, uh, and the LGBTQ community? I think it is. I just think the nature of the culture in Hawaii is much more open and accepting than many other places in the country. My sense is, yes, it is different, and it is more welcoming. When you were elected in 1980, I think California could strongly be described as sort of as Reagan country, wasn't it? I think the, the, the state was. certainly went for Reagan in 80 and 84. Reagan was the governor, um, and following him was Duke Majin, another very conservative Republican mm -hmm. who vetoed uh, a statewide non-discrimination bill. Okay, and when did that change? Do you remember? I do remember very well. It was in the first part of my term in the early 80s, because the day that he vetoed that bill, I introduced in the city of Laguna Beach an ordinance, a law, that prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation in, in employment, housing, and public accommodation. Did it pass? Absolutely, it passed. Unanimous? Unanimous. And... At that time, I suppose we were seeing a lot of movement like that locally, uh, or just the beginnings of it, maybe. Beginnings of it, yes, the beginnings so of it. So very much Laguna Beach was a trendsetter in that. We were, along with the city of Los Angeles, the city of San Francisco, and a couple of other smaller cities in the state. But yes, those of us who were open and gay, and particularly in office, were very offended when the governor vetoed that particular bill. Right. Because we had lots of testimony at the Capitol about it and how important it is like it is now in the federal government. Still very important, and these, these rights are being eroded. I mean, even when we have a national administration that is refusing the uh, embassies to allow uh, you know, fly a pride flag uh, during this pride month, you know, and, and uh, all of the insults. Well, not this, only that, it, that, Winston. A list of, of, it's, of uh, But there's a new attack now on our community from the White House. It, uh, it is. It's an attack. Well, we don't, we don't have to look far when we see that Mike Pence, who signed right. the awful legislation in uh, Indianapolis, is the vice president. Probably That's correct. There is a concerted, deliberate um, assault on LGBTQ rights, right. I think, that we see from the government, and it's emboldened others. That's why we're seeing spikes in hate crimes and all kinds of things like that, but the tide is... Tide is moving in. This is just the, the little bit that's going back before it comes in all the way. That's my feeling. That's my hope, anyway. But uh, I don't know. Are you are you remaining optimistic? Oh, about very. This? I'm very optimistic. Why? Basically, the youth, the youth of this nation, will not put up for this kind of discrimination and uh, lousy behavior when it comes to anybody who is considered different. It, it, so this is a last gasp, hopefully, hopefully. of this just uh, reaction, reactionary um, oppressiveness uh, towards, it doesn't really matter who you are, if you're handicapped, black, uh, Hispanic immigrants, God Correct. Say, children in cages. Well, and don't forget the Obama administration did a tremendous amount of positive work for the LGBTQ community. And I think that's why this administration feels the need to reverse some of that. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need to stand together arm in arm and say absolutely not. That's an interesting point. So maybe if Obama really hadn't done much, we might even see something that moved <laughs> sideways in this or not really anything at all. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I think it's this is a case of if you say up, this is going to say down or, or vice versa. Well, besides you add into that, Winston, the philosophical difference that the current administration has based on the re Christian religion, the interpretation of the Bible, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That comes right into play. And we'll, and we should qualify that with a particular, uh, I think, uh, interpretation of, that, of those religions, because well, there's sure, very many good people out there that are, of that are they're Christians of faith that, of that, course. that are positive and progressive and believe in the of message course. of, you know, love your, love your neighbor. And uh, I, this, it's, a, it's a very deep issues. It's, it's getting right at our cores as a, as a society, as our individuals, and, uh, and people that we know that are affected around us. And this thing is, it's, it's also, when you have this, it's, we're setting an example for the world, good, bad, or otherwise. So, but fortunately, we're seeing other places around the world that are saying, oh, no, we're not going down that path. We're, we're, we're yes. increasing freedom. Right. And, and cultures rights. that are older, particularly, that's what's important to me. Cultures that are older, that have been dealt with this issue for many, many years, and now are obviously doing the right thing.
it's it's an exciting time, and I'm looking forward. I'm I, I'm basically positive. Sometimes I get a little bit down and pessimistic, but then when I see people like you and everybody else that's coming out and saying I'm my authentic self, it's really important for all of us. And we are going to touch more on these and uh, what we're seeing uh, nationally and uh, about the community and, and just other societal things in a moment. We're going to take a short break. I am Winston Welch. This is Out and About on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series, and we are talking with Mr. Robert Gentry, uh, the uh, former mayor of Laguna Beach, California. We'll be back in a minute, so stay tuned for more of the story. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Hey, we're back. We're live. Happy Canada Day and July 1st, 2019. I'm Winston Wilson. This is Out and About on the Think Tech live streaming network series, where you will always find the most exciting and interesting people, like my esteemed guest today, Mr. Robert Gentry. So welcome back, Bob. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here today. So you were the first uh, out mayor in a U.S. city that we know of um, in Laguna Beach, California in the early 80s. At that same time, just dovetailing with it was a tragic uh, epidemic of HIV and AIDS that just rained down hard um, across the land, across the world. It's still raging in many places. Um, what was that like? Um, it had some wonderful times and some horrible times. Um, when I went into office, I never expected to be in the middle of a pandemic where my city had the highest per capita of AIDS patients in the country. Mm. Now that, that was a lot because we were a city of 25,000 and per capita we had the highest. What that meant for me was I was literally watching my um, constituents drop, drop and drop. And uh, I felt like we as a city needed to do something about this, even though it was a public health crisis and we weren't in the business of health, we needed to be there because the federal government at this point had done nothing. Silent. President Ronald Reagan had said nothing. Um, health and Human Services had said nothing. And the gay community around the nation was starting to coalesce around how we're going to save lives and take care of our brothers and our sisters who were ill. And I proposed to my city that we establish a group of people to advise the city council on what we should do in our town about HIV and AIDS. And it was a tough fight, but I got it, got it through, and we did some pretty wonderful things to help people. First thing we did was we extended our non-discrimination law that I had authored a year early so that there can be no discrimination based on HIV uh, determination in housing, accommodation, or employment. Now that took a load off of hundreds of people in my community sure. who were worried about being evicted, losing their jobs, and all the rest of it, because that was happening around the country. And still is, as and we still mentioned, is. To, to, uh, and not just if you have HIV. Yep, but, right, uh, right. Uh, so that's, and I think that has now morphed, and it's, and it's become uh, under ADA, actually, at this point. Yes. Uh, but <clears> at the time, it was, it, it's, it needed to be written in, and probably still does in, in some places. It does. Um, 
So you saw, I mean, it was just, you know, the plague years and, and coming out of it the other side, it was like a, a war in many ways. And we didn't see really any relief on that until maybe what, the mid 90s, would you say, when they came out with some well, of the effective Well, I, I would say some relief. There still isn't 100% relief. What we found was as the public health folks got into it and CDC got into it, and we put research money into it, that research money generated protease inhibitors, which helped uh, control the virus in the body. What that meant was that you became then uh, a slave to medications and their, all their side effects. So it wasn't just wonderful, we now have pills. It was, yes, we have some pills, but we also have new things to deal with. So it, it wasn't all rosy, but there were some good parts to it, and that was indeed a wonderful part to it. How do you, do you think we're going to get to AIDS, new, zero new infections? Yes, we will. Yep. Yes, Pretty sure. we, and and we are will. you optimistic for actually a cure, just stopping this thing like they can with other It'll, It will happen. It, it could have happened a lot earlier. Yes. Had we gotten onto this quickly, we would have been able to be much far ahead now than we are. Why? Because we had all those cases right up front, all of them. The research arena was ready for Pete, ready for all the scientists to work on it, but the money wasn't there. And due to discrimination, I'm just yes, going you to bet. posit. You bet. You and bet. I think, uh, yeah, well, and we're, that we're still facing today. Speaking of those challenges of the LGBTQ community, what we've had faced, say, in the maybe when you were growing up, um, I'm guessing. Uh, you were in California, you've probably, probably the laws of California said you could have been put in prison for, for being gay. Um, probably, oh, I forgot this. Uh, probably I could have been. Fortunately, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't raised in California, though. Okay. I was raised in uh, suburban Boston, which is a very Victorian community. And um, there was no word, the, the word gay was not there. Right. You were a homo. Yes. That was yeah. what you were. You yeah. were a homo. Yeah. Or a faggot. Yeah, or a faggot. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. That's why it's interesting because when the young people have, have they call themselves queer, right? Uh -huh. I right. think a lot of older gays think, oh, I don't like queer because that was such an insult. But I think it's sort of taking it back on some level. Well, you have to do that. It's an important thing to do. Yeah. Terribly yeah. important thing to do. Well, and, and so as we're facing, we move forward to being completely illegal to being semi-legal or not illegal, but certainly not protected right. in any uh, comprehensive scheme nationally. What are you thinking the challenges, major challenges facing our community from within and without are at this point? Well, I think the immediate need for the LGBT community right now is to have federal protection. That's key. Because once we have federal protection for our work and our places to live, that's going to explode all over the country. And other states and so forth, they're going to adopt that that haven't so far. Then I think we need to really work on the local level of getting to know each other. And again, coming out, coming out, coming out, and being authentic. Because our movement would not be where it is today had it not for, starting at Stonewall, people being authentic and saying, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm transgender, I'm whatever it was, and I'm in your family, I'm in your church, I'm in your place of work. And that helped, that helped the attitudes around the nation, as did the HIV epidemic. Yes. See, the HIV epidemic, as you well know, brought so many people out into the open that never would have been nor could have been. Now, it was horrible that they had to do this because of a virus. A forced but outing. Nonetheless, yep. nonetheless, if you look back on the big picture, it was very helpful and very powerful and very important and still is. I think of it as a galvanizing uh, moment for the community because people were forcibly outed by a disease. And you think, well, how did... Charles can't be gay. Yeah, Charles is gay. He's just mm -hmm. hidden it very well. Right. And uh, of course, never put out a picture of his, you know, partner or whoever because that wouldn't have. Well, he could have been fired. Number one, but mm -hmm. just the stigma of that. And so, and then suddenly he's sick, and 
Oh, there it is. So, it, and, and that this movement that we need to come together, get some money, get some power, get some, you know, the people that do it, act up. Right? Heroes, yeah, yeah, heroes, sure, sure. the people making the noises uh, out there. The other thing I think that we need to focus on, and here in Hawaii particularly too, and it becomes part of my background being at the table, is that we need more leaders to get elected. We need to have people in the public office, public limelight, public sector, at the table of policy, at the state level, at the county level, city level, making decisions for the people. And that also helps a great deal. Now, yes, Hawaii is very accepting. Our laws are good. We've had wonderful pro-gay governors. We've been very fortunate at that. But we need, we really need more of the grassroots folks at the table. Do you think that they need to be gay or LGBTQ or allies or both? Or is one more important than the other? Yes, I think it is. I think it's more important to be part of the community, the gay community. That's the basic authenticity right now. A few years from now, it may not be as necessary, but it is necessary, I think. And I think when you say gay, you mean big gay, the big umbrella. Yeah, sure. yeah, I, I LGBTQ. Think, yeah, and I think we, we shorthand it for gay sometimes, and people think, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not in your alphabet. But right. No, I think it's, it's kind of become a shorthand for me anyway. Sure. So uh, apologies to anybody who didn't hear the, their alphabet. Like, because the kids today, I mean, what we're really seeing now is fascinating with the gender queer, the gender neutral, the, oh, the non-gendered, uh, non-binary, mm -hmm. where even if we're inside of this community, we're thinking, whoa, these, the, the, the kids coming up or have a totally different frame of reference for them. Uh, so somebody said, uh, oh, hey, sorry, Winston, but gay is passe. It's, and that was what it was. It's all about trans. I think maybe it's almost kind of moving beyond that to the, these new things where I go to conferences now and it says my preferred pronouns are. And this is very interesting, mm -hmm. you know, and these are main, getting to be mainstream prone uh, sure. uh, of a conferences. So, sure. Um, you know, you're, you're an amazing volunteer. Uh, just to throw out a couple things that you do, board member and past president of the Waikiki Health, uh, which is an awesome organization, which we had here before, the president of the Gold Coast Neighborhood Association, a VASH volunteer, which is immensely gratifying, and president of your condo board. And we were talking earlier about which one was the hardest one. You said the condo board was not the hardest one, which was great. Uh, what would you say... Um, if you were to leave us with some words of wisdom, what, uh, what would that be? You're, you're obviously have been very active and engaged in public and private volunteer communities all of your life. Is there anything that you'd like to leave our audience with before we have you back again to follow up this conversation with a lot of other questions that I have? Well, I just, yes, I would. I, I, I am of the belief that being involved in society and your community wherever you can be is extremely vital to the health of that community, and to the growth of the individual person. And if you, are, if you identify with the LGBTQ situation, it's more, more important to be authentic out there and seek leadership positions. Because when you're in a leadership position, you can affect your community at the micro and the mag magro level. No question about it. So that's the key, I think. And it's fun and it's exciting and you can make a difference. It's not a power business. It's not an ego situation. It's helping your society. And that's what I think we're all here to do in our own way. Small, large, medium, however we can do it. We got to do it. Step up to the plate. That's exactly right. Well, I think you're the perfect example of someone who has stepped to the plate, who lives authentically. Uh, who's an example for all of us. It doesn't matter what our age, gender, sexual orientation, uh, ethnicity is. Uh, you're the real deal. This is exactly uh, 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 a hero to, to follow. So folks, if you're out there and you're, you're listening, we've got had Bob Gentry today on the show. He is an awesome example of someone who does live authentically and a perfect guest for Out and About on, I think, like live streaming show and i would like to thank you very much for coming in today you will come back again absolutely we're going to have a lot of maybe we can have some more uh in-depth discussion about a lot of things so uh, with that we do have to close so i will say thank you very much to all of the folks that put on our shows here broadcast engineer robert mclean our floor manager Haley ikeda and jay fidel our executive producer who puts it all together uh, i'll see you every other monday here on out and about.
live. Aloha, folks, and happy Canada Day. Thank you.